Uh, now on this podcast, we'll take three episodes of the Fox Kids version of Spider-Man that aired in the mid-90s and discuss and review. This is not for Pantheon eligibility, but it is a fun side project that is actually going to end up taking pretty much the rest of the year. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Twitter at JeromeC1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast, Apple Podcasts, if you're Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four or five star review so as to help people discover uh, this show and the great work that uh, the folks at the real world are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you could do so by following us on Twitter at Hero Pantheon. Brian. We are starting a new season. Uh, We've been, uh, we were off the first week of April as uh, everybody got to hear uh, Kevin Ford and I discuss the High Fidelity TV series. Last week, Brian and I gave our thoughts on the Morbius movie uh, that was, they've been threatening to release it for months and years at this point, and they finally did, so you can go back, listen to our thoughts on that. Plus, The Batman that we reviewed last month, too. But Brian, tonight we are starting a brand new season of Spider-Man. And Brian, things uh, things are a little bit different. We've got an established Spider-Man, but this season is going to be heavily focused on Spider-Man turning into a mutant, question mark? Yeah, this is my favorite season by far, just because of, like, the mystery of it all and what's going on with Spider-Man. I initially thought, like, he got injected with somebody by, like, one of his enemies or something like that. It turns out, like, he's just naturally mutating, which is really cool because it kind of makes it, like, this this thing, like, the spider bite, like, gives you these powers. But now, like, months later, he's turning into this monster. Well, he's going to turn into a monster eventually. But this concept is really, really cool, I thought, because it's like this, you know, it's cause and effect. There's always going to be these, like, consequences for getting your powers, right? This is going to be a major consequence of it all, all that spider bite. And they kind of reveal it in the first episode. Uh, a little bit of flashback where he gets bitten by the radioactive spider. There's a lot of mutant genes going on, mutant, uh, genetics going on. So it's, it's obvious what they're leading to, especially, uh, you know, when they say the word mutant and genetics and stuff like that. Uh, in the, up, up, in the up, next up, up, upcoming episode, I think episode four or five, they go to the X-Men and they have to talk to Professor X. So they're setting up this big arc for Spider-Man right now, and he doesn't know what's going on with his body, so there's kind of also this body horror thing that's going to develop as well later on in the season, so I got to credit this season a lot, because this really dug my interest when I was a kid, because, like, I kind of dove in halfway through the season where he's got his four arms, spoiler alert, but, like, seeing that the first time, it's like, whoa, what the hell is going on with Spider-Man? He's turning into this monster, because whenever you see something like that as a kid, you associate that as, like, the creature, the monster of the movie or the show or whatever. So when you see the hero turning into that, that's a complete 180, and you don't know where it's going to go next. So this is the start of that, and you can see, like, right now, they kind of took it in Spider-Man 2 where he was losing some of his powers, but here in the beginning of episode 1, he's starting to lose his powers a little bit, but it's only because his body's mutating and changing, and he doesn't know why. So he goes to uh, Dr. Connors, and, yeah, that I, I love Dr. Connors in this series. Like, he's so much better. He's that mentor figure. I love the fact that Peter can go to him for this kind of help. But even Dr. Connors doesn't even know what's going on. So there's this big mystery of what's going on with him, Peter. And then all this other things going on, on the outside where basically got Kingpin putting together this B squad of uh, Sinister Six members at the same time. So there's a lot going on. But uh, this whole thing is tied together with this whole mutant gene thing going on. And that's kind of the tie-in for all the entire season, actually. So 
Uh, I love that there's this backbone now, and now you got this continuation storyline because every episode is going to tie back into this mutant storyline. Yes, every episode is labeled as a chapter of this particular series. So season two is is the neogenic nightmare. We get introduced to the idea of neogenics um, in this episode, or reintroduced to it. So this is going to be a really important topic. So you mentioned the sinister sticks. Brian, that is not the name of this group. They are referred to as the Insidious Six for the purposes of this animated show. I have a theory as to why they were not called the Sinister Six. Are you ready for it? Do you have any inkling as to what I'm about to say? I mean, I could have, I just put them over as the B-Squad, so that's kind of my theory as to why they're not the, you know, Sinister Six. So, if you recall, the X-Men animated series was also airing at the same time. I don't think season, I think season two of the X-Men had aired earlier, but Mr. Sinister was a prominent part of that season. And because this is a kid's show and X-Men is also a kid's show and they also take place in the same universe, uh, that is my theory as to why they were called the Insidious Six because of Mr. Sinister being in the X-Men. Oh, so you thought kids would associate Mr. Sinister as like crossing over to Spider-Man and this is his group of people. Yes. I get you. Get, I get you. That makes a lot of sense. Because I, at first I thought, whoa, they didn't get the rights to this. It's the, the Sinister Six. That's like a big thing. How do they not do that? But again, you know, it's marketing. You know, it's all about the marketing and this marketing to kids. You can't confuse kids too much, even though the plot does get a little too in the adult area in terms of like, you know, uh, uh, nuances and stuff like that. We'll get to that episode too. But I do get you on that point. And uh, it just kind of sucks that they started off with like the B Squad. And uh, I know you kind of got annoyed with everyone breaking out in prison and everyone having their costumes all ready to go. I So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. I, I actually really like the beginning because we're kind of resetting Peter Parker's Spider-Man in a way because he talks about the idea of being close to someone, mentions Felicia Hardy and Mary Jane Watson. He's still kind of in this love triangle and talks about kind of his own struggles. And then very quickly, he just starts to lose his powers and we're kind of thrown into this storyline right from the start. So I really appreciate just how they are spending their time. It's not like we're wasting any time. Like within the first five minutes, Spider-Man is losing his powers. And this is something that's going to be important for the entire season. So I really, really like that. I think it's funny that Spider-Man falls into a dumpster filled with feathers. Like I could easily just be really annoyed and offended by what they did. I just kind of found it funny. I mean... You can't just have him splat on the ground, man. He he would have really gotten hurt and all that kind of thing. <laughs> I just like the fact that, you know, they incorporated this in the actual Spider-Man 2, right? But he didn't land in, like, a trash can full of feathers. I think he just landed in the trash can or something. So I do like the fact that like, we mentioned this before in previous episodes, how they kind of pay homage to that. So obviously Sam Raimi's a big fan of the show, and that was a big influence. So I, I do like that because it definitely brought in those memories of Tobey Maguire, like trying to get on the wall again and he couldn't do it and just kind of giving up on himself. So that, I do like that connectivity there. And um, yeah, I do like this character coming up, Silvermane. He's like this old school gangster that is trying to like vie for power. And I couldn't help but think like, you know, based on our Batman review, very similar in terms of this whole idea of this criminal underground running the city and you got Kingpin as the head of it all, and there's this struggle for power, and that's basically what this is. Is like Silvermane is trying to get, you know, top of the food chain. He's kind of like probably the second in command or something like that, even though he's in charge of his own family. Very much like the Godfather. I love that meeting that they had, and that they even at the meeting they try to like overtake Kingpin physically by force. The Kingpin just breaks out, and uh, he's like, "You're not gonna fuck with me." So I love that whole dynamic right there, and it just leads to just more, like, turning on each other and stuff like that. But that kind of plays into episode two when Silverman gets kidnapped. But I do like that character because it's, like, you know, that old-school gangster. Because his gangsters that work for him are very much, like, those Dick Tracy-type gangsters. Did you notice that? Oh, my God. I literally – one of the notes that I put down is our Hammerhead and Owl, uh, two of the prominent gangsters mentioned, are they Dick Tracy rejects? Are they transitioning away from the Dick Tra Tracy universe – into the Spider-Man universe, I have so many questions about Hammerhead and Owl in particular. Or are they from the Bugs Bunny cartoon, uh, the Daffy Duck cartoon I'm thinking about? You know the one. Yeah, uh, with the, the gangster and the tall guy and the little guy. I know what you're talking about. But yeah, I, I, it's it's one of the best Looney Tunes yeah, I've ever been but, made. 
but I do think that's why I like Silverman because he's I guess to I guess he was just trying to represent this old school idea with the old school gangsters. And that's what it kind of represents because we never really got that in the first season. It's all about these new new age tech, you know, villains that are trying to destroy the city. And you got this old school gangster who's kind of like way behind at the times trying to vie for power. I kind of like that. I don't know if I, I I was the only one that picked up on that because like I'm older now. But as a kid, Silverman was just another villain. But now looking back, it's like, oh, yeah, it's this old man struggling to. With, for power to fighting with Kingpin, and he's got like no, he's got like old henchmen compared to like the newer henchmen. So I thought I like that contrast in styles. Kind of, I'm very up and down on that part of the storyline because on the one hand, I, I think gangster storylines can be really interesting. I think the problem is at this point, it feels like every gangster story has has been told. And if you're going to tell this story, I would rather it be in the Batman universe as opposed to the Spider Man universe. And like, even in the Daredevil TV series, the gangster stuff kind of got annoying and repetitive at times. But the one thing I will say is uh, I would agree that Silverman is a really interesting character just in terms of this is a guy who's very clearly trying to keep his power. And he knows the Kingpin is a threat. And the decision is ultimately made uh, by Kingpin that he he has to kind of assess this threat and, and figure out what to do. So what does he do? Uh, he decides to break out uh, the Insidious Six. Basically, it is comprised of Dr. Octopus and uh, five B-villains. Uh, we get the Chameleon, we get Mysterio, we get Shocker, we get Rhino. I think the most amusing thing to me about this entire sequence is... Shocker is in his costume when they're in the prison, as is Rhino, which keeps up the running gag from the previous season because we remember uh, that Rhino, when he when when he's called by Kingpin, is already in his outfit. Uh, how do you how do you let somebody stay in that outfit when he literally has like a pointy thing on his forehead? It's just it's bizarre to me. Also, the other villains. Uh, outfits and costumes very conveniently hung up very nicely somewhere in the prison and uh, it's 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 so strange to me Brian this once again shows are, are they making a subtle commentary on the incompetency of the NYPD for men because like when we were talking about the Venom episode how dramatic that that crash was with the shuttle and the way they approached it and the dramatic approach to it. And that felt so real. And in this case, it's like the opposite. It feels like kind of like a cartoon, like it is a cartoon, but like Bugs Bunny style. Like you talked about Bugs Bunny, like very much Bugs Bunny, because like all of a sudden the chameleon, I, I don't know how, but like the chameleon's powers come from his button on his belt. And all of a sudden I don't, I couldn't remember if he was wearing the belt before that the little robot came in to tell him that they're going to, they're going to break him out or not. So he was in there with his, like chameleon thing the whole time and they just let him have it so he could have just turned into anybody and confused the guards at any time it was very confusing like they didn't really like like i feel like they didn't oceans 11 it enough you know what i mean they could have made it so much more smarter and simpler but they just kind of made it chaotic and just like made it you know the nypd incompetent but i guess that's the point because every time they try to help out or help spider-man or whatever they just epically fail so at this point I guess that's just kind of the idea when it comes to the Spider-Man animated series is that the cops are just inept and they can't do anything because everyone is just so overpowering. See, anytime I see a group of big villains come together in an animated series, I always think about the greatest episode of the the Batman the Animated Series has ever been all, almost got him. And you will never see a, as good of, a, of an animated episode of TV, I believe. And... This uh, the, some of these moments, especially when they kill the robot Spider-Man, just kind of made me want to go revisit that episode again. And of course, they are they're kind of built up, and Kingpin has uh, has brought them together. Um, not qu- I, I would not say Avengers style, but clearly that's kind of the vibe that they're going for. And uh, we get Spider-Man the next night kind of going through Central Park and kind of doing his thing, dealing with the issues about uh, the the escape criminals. And then he is still also dealing with the fact that um, his powers are waning. He even uh, he takes one of the longest naps ever known to man as he sleeps from 7 p.m. until 9.30 p.m. two days later. Which, shouldn't that may have sent him to the hospital at a certain point if he's not waking up? Well, he did go to the hospital the next episode, <laughs> but 
Yeah, I thought that was hilarious because clearly that again that shows you something that's going on physically within him, like that body horror type stuff. Like, if you would have told me in a real human situation, like you real life situation, that I was asleep for a day and a half, I would freak the fuck out. You know what I mean? Like just like he did, and just kind of panic. And I thought that was like a really good detail because like something clearly is going on physically with him because even Spider Man doesn't sleep for that long without there's something being up. And something being seriously wrong. And Brian, wouldn't you know that uh, at Empire State University, Dr. Connors is giving a lesson on neogenics, which we will be bringing up and discussing throughout the season. And um, there's a, there's an interesting character that is making his debut. He looks significantly older than the other people, and his character design clearly makes him look evil. Michael Morbius, funny enough, Brian, how interesting and amazing is our timing that last week we reviewed the Morbius movie, and now this week, I swear this is not how we planned it, but this week we are talking about the debut of Michael Morbius. He has not quite achieved his final form in these three episodes, but next week we will be discussing Michael Morbius in his uh, supervillain form, but this week uh, he's just awfully suspicious. Yeah, we definitely planned it. I mean, we definitely planned the fact that, you know, Morbius was going to be delayed at the beginning of the year when we were planning this out. Because we knew that was going to happen, and we knew it was going to be on April 1st, because we know everything. Because we're psychic, and we predict everything, and nobody listens to us. So, there you go. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It was pure coincidence, I swear to God. Thank God Jared Leto doesn't have the accent, because that would have been too much. Because uh, this accent of Michael Morbius for the show, I get it. It's supposed to be Transylvanian or something like that, European. I get it. I get it. That's what they're going for. The European sexy vampire. That's the 90s thing. Um, he's he's designed much older. I guess that's, you know, uh, intentful because he's like this. Va- he's he's going to become a vampire eventually, the living vampire. But there's always something about those older looking uh, dudes in horror movies at the college. You just can't trust them, man, because they're going to go after the young girls and something bad's going to happen. And that's exactly what kind of this situation is right now, because he goes after Felicia Hardy, targets her and they're going out for a little bit now. But, um, yeah, it, he's much older than her, clearly. <laughs> but, hey, it's college. It's, 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 that's what college is sometimes. I've been, I've been in a class with, like, 65-year-olds, 70-year-olds when I was, like, 20. So uh, it is what it is. But uh, it's cool to see him debut, you know what I mean? And it's good they didn't, like, immediately give you the Morbius character because they're building up to it, obviously. And I like how they're building him up in the background first. And then they're going to give you the storyline because it, then it makes, you more, it makes it more effective. And personal, especially with Felicia Hardy being in the middle of it all. So uh, I like this little tease and build right here. Yeah, the black coat with the <laughs> with the with the collar up and like that, and oh, oh yeah, all the the weird looking hand gestures he's making and the way he's talking. But hey, credit to him, he did stop that mugger and got the, uh, Felicia Hardy's uh, purse back. So he he did start out with good intentions. Yeah, at the very least, uh, that's that is something uh, that he did. We get some cat and mouse games between Spider-Man and the Sin- and the Insidious Six as uh, Spider-Man is continuing to lose his powers. Eventually, uh, the subway plays a prominent role as it saves him, bails him out, and eventually he ends up at Doctor Connor's office in Spider-Man form and is asking basically what happened and. Uh, Kurt says that he needs to be more, do more tests to be sure, but he thinks that Spider-Man's DNA is mutating permanently and that for all he knows, his powers could be disappearing, which, of course, is a bad thing because Spider-Man is having to deal with the uh, Insidious Six. Uh, we get some dissension with the Insidious Six because they are stupid supervillains, so of course they're going to fight with each other. So Kingpin ultimately has to order to, for them to search the city and, and find them. And eventually uh, they decide to set a trap uh, by involving Aunt May. And that is uh, that is basically how the uh, the first episode of this season ends, is that uh, she is revealed to ultimately be the chameleon. The chameleon turns basically into a witch and asks Spider-Man if he is ready for the end. That it is tremendously amusing to me that that's how they decide to end the episode in this very this very horror like way, and it's especially funny because there is of course a prominent horror franchise that is called Insidious. Well, that would be to come years later. <laughs> Let's get that out the way because you know this is ninety four, but um, yeah, I do like the fact that as you can, t- I think like this is for me personally. I think they're getting better at the cutaways because. Um, 
you know, in, in most cases, they would have cut to commercial with these fadeaways, right? But uh, in season two, especially, I think they're getting their stride in terms of when to cut away to commercial because they're always cutting it at the most dramatic moments. Spider Man's falling to, to near his near death, or like the villains just catch him in a corner like this, or something like that. I think they've got, I think they really got it down in terms of timing and editing when it comes to these cutaways to commercial and then cut away to, to the, to be continued. So I thought this is uh this was what's really get like, it's starting to really get going in terms of like um, everyday watching TV, you know, syndicated, like getting there at the exact same time watching it because it's starting to get like almost like the soap opera feel now with the to be continued and like all these little details that you have to pick up on for the next episode. So it's starting to get juicy. You know what I mean? All the little details are starting to get juicy and come together. So I'm starting to like this, especially with the cutaway and the drama of it all. And now as soon as the next episode picks up, he's in that corner again. So very much so like I got a credit to, you know, Adam West Batman, you know, like they had those two episodes a week. And then the first episode would, would be end on a cliffhanger just like this. And then it just leads right into the next episode the next night with that, you know, big drama and that big anticipation. So that anticipation going to the next episode, they really got it down. I think um, like last season was pretty much, you know, aside from a few story arcs, you know, one, one shot episodes, this idea of them to be continued, it's going to get really epic because X-Men starts doing this well. And then it makes you feel like there's this giant story going on bigger than could have anticipated. My favorite part of the season so far, the three episodes we watched is actually at the beginning of season two episode two i should say and that is the moment when spider-man is captured by the insidious six and he basically gets himself in a lot of trouble he is unmasked he is revealed to be peter parker but of course the insidious six don't believe that spider-man and peter parker are one and the same because it was far too easy for him to be captured i this is such a great detail it's a great use of both storylines because, you know, you're playing the long game with Spider-Man's powers like you don't know what's going on. He's doing this while also dealing with the Insidious Six. So I love kind of the short term and the long term storylines that are going on. I just I, I can't express my love for this enough because it's just it's such a unique way of kind of building this story. And you think, oh, him being him being revealed is like this huge moment but it just it, it, the piss immediately gets taken out of it just because they don't believe that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And I love just the dynamics that play out throughout the rest of the episode uh, that Spider-Man, Peter Parker, they're pretending to not be the same person and just how Spider-Man has to use his intelligence because his powers are kind of in and out. So uh, the reason that he is able to not defeat the Insidious Six, but the reason that he is able to kind of escape and at least get some some measure of victory. Um, he's able to do that because of his intelligence, not because of his powers. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, that was just, that was so well written. I think this is one of the so far the best written episode of the season or the series, I should say. Um, just that intelligent writing and that fact that it's like very layered. And like the way that uh, he does the voice acting as Spider-Man, acting as if he doesn't, you know, acting as if you got to act like you're not Peter Parker or you're not Spider-Man, even though you know you're Spider-Man. It's like that, you know, complex voice acting, you know, with all the layers going on. So very well done. And uh, just even he took it even a step further when he pretended to be the chameleon. You know what I mean? That was even like that was even more so like even more smart because like. You know, because Chameleon's going in and out the whole two episodes, being everybody and different different people. So he's using that idea and playing it on the villains themselves, and then leads to Rhino like attacking like the Scorpion, and like Rhino, you you cut a hole in my suit. <laughs> and I was like, wow, one hole in the suit can just ruin your suit. That's uh, that's a B villain for you. So I thought that was hilarious when that all kind of came together. And then the other thing too is that uh, the gangster that we were talking about, he got caught. Because he was trying to, like, turn on Kingpin. So he's, like, you know, he was caught by the Insidious Six. But Spider-Man breaks him out because he thought, oh, he, they kidnapped this other guy. Why did you, they kidnap you? And he says to Spider-Man, I'm just a rich guy. He doesn't tell Spider-Man the fact that he's an actual criminal and, and crime leader. So there's that factor, too, where it's, like, oh, a more smart writing going on because they're playing. He Okay, while Spider-Man is playing the, the, the Six, he's getting played by this other gangster. And he doesn't even know that he's this powerful gangster and he's, he's freed him. So there's all these complex things going on that tie into the storyline much later on in the season, too, because it's all going to come back. Like, all these things come back to haunt Spider-Man. 
So uh, I, I love this little build up here and the way that he uses his intelligence and all these little things. And the fact that he's getting played at the same time just adds to it. Yeah, I just think this is an episode that really builds well, like you were saying. I, I love the use of the uh, the chameleon. I just wish the problem with the chameleon is I love the idea of a shapeshifter. I love that what some of the things that you can do. The problem is because this is a kid show, they have to beat you over the head that it's the chameleon. So the belt is always in sight. And it's always hard for me to kind of stretch the reality of what's happening because I can always see the belt. So that I think that's kind of the one issue. But I love the fact that Doc Ock is kind of playing this doctor and that Peter Parker is in the health clinic and that and that kind of thing. And I kind of love that we get kind of a final payoff to the Felicia Hardy stuff because uh, Peter Parker does not show up for a date and Felicia Hardy decides that she is going to date Michael Morbius, and that opens the door for Peter Parker to explore his relationship with Mary Jane more. So I think that is, um, I think that's all really, really interesting stuff too. Just kind of how they're paying off and, and they're kind of getting to the meat and potatoes of like what is actually important in terms of the Spider-Man lore, that being Mary Jane Watson and not necessarily felicia hardy yeah and uh it just sets it up well because now felicia's in this re- deep relationship and when the morbius stuff does eventually happen she gets really affected by it more so than you know a normal relationship because she's so she kind of falls in love with the guy like in this short amount of time so there's going to be some really gut-wrenching moments coming up especially with the morbius stuff so I- i'm excited and i think the next batch of episodes we're gonna get the x-men stuff and then eventually that's going to lead to Blade. So there's all kinds of crazy stuff coming up in the season. Uh, for sure. And uh, we end the episode in a really fascinating way because Dr. Connors and Spider-Man discuss what's happening even more. Um, and it is revealed that Spider-Man's DNA is mutating even further, but is unsure what he is changing into. And there is a possibility, Brian, that Spider-Man may be mutating into dun 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 something that isn't even human yeah that's that's the body horror stuff man that's you know i kind of was like whoa you know when i saw him with the forearms later on in the season i was like whoa this is some crazy stuff right now and looking back it's like yeah that's that's what body horror type stuff is and that's kind of you know you know when it's like the alien kind of feeling something inside you growing something like that the idea that there's this mutation going on in your body and you don't know what's going on It's pretty scary stuff, man. So I like the fact that they're kind of building that up and it's going to get really monstrous pretty soon. So going into episode three, I'm really excited. It's like episode two ends on this really interesting cliffhanger. We know that there's going to be this huge crossover coming forth uh, with the X-Men in episode four. So how are they going to continue this storyline? Unfortunately, episode three, I think, is just a huge dud. I think it's my least favorite of all the episodes. And... I think similar to something we talked about on season one, I think the reason this episode works, doesn't work is because it is so heavily focused on um, kind of things that are happening directly to Mary Jane. The Hydro Man character is completely uninteresting to me because again, we have all, we've, we already have all these B villains and that's all Hydro Man. Hydro Man is like this weird combination of kind of Flash Thompson, Eddie Brock, and kind of like uh, the Shocker or somebody like that. So this episode does very little for me. I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. I think, if anything, it does kind of entrench the relationship more between Peter, Spider-Man, and Mary Jane, because we do get some background on on Mary Jane's poor taste in men. So I think that's kind of that's kind of the best parts. I also like that Spider-Man, Peter Parker, does have to get a special kind of webbing. I like that idea because... You know, he has obviously been using webbing for the entire run of the series. But again, we kind of see the fact that he has to adapt to the situation and change things. So I really like that part of it. But boy, does the rest of this just do absolutely nothing for me. Well, basically, the idea is it's a toxic masculinity and it's like a really toxic ex, uh, borderline abusive ex, Mary Jane. Totally like, you know, just, you know, a manipulative asshole uh you know emotionally abusive like really just bad all around right and that's kind of like oh you're not supposed to act this way as a, as a man kind of thing but they didn't really hammer that message home at the end they just like oh mary jane you're safe now away from the bad you know ex-boyfriend we saved you you know there's no really moral lesson to it all we just saved you 
You know, I think it would have really hammered home if they would have just been like, hey, you know, like, don't be an abusive uh, prick and don't be, you know, toxic masculinity and all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't really a thing then. Like, no one was really talking about it, but they were touching on it here, obviously, with, like, the way that the Hydro Man was acting, like, a just complete, like, oh, my God, unlikable, just totally unlikable, abusive, whatever. And he had really no, like, background as to why he was acting that way. You would think, like, they would have had a clip of him having an, a, an abusive father or something, like a sexist father or something like that. They didn't even do that. So they just kind of had, just threw it out there, made him, like, this, you know, villain with all these, you know, not really a deep villain, just, like, you know, on the surface, bad guy, hates women, that kind of thing, treats them like objects, all that kind of bullshit. And that's kind of what they were going for. And Mary Jane was the center of his, like, of the obsession, so to speak. And then when he gets his powers in the Navy, even when he gets his powers, it was lame because, like, this weird ooze comes from the water when he gets taken down on the ship. And we don't even make an explanation of what the ooze is or whatever. He just becomes Hydro Man. So that was pretty lame. It kind of sucks that, like, they had to throw this in there because what it really is setting up to a big reveal, like this Hydro Man stuff, to a big reveal in season four, I think. When it comes to Mary Jane, because this does come back. It's not like this was like a random storyline. Like this does tie into later on in a really big way. I don't want to spoil it yet because it's it's a really big twist in season four, I believe. But um, this Hydro Man stuff is going to come back and it's going to come back to haunt Mary Jane. And it's going to come back to haunt Peter Parker. Even though this particular episode was not good, it will come back to haunt them. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how excited I am for that, but hopefully the, the payoff is, is more interesting. Uh, we do get Mary Jane coming so close to figuring out what's really going on as well uh, as she tells Spider-Man that he sounds like her friend Peter Parker. And however, to keep Mary Jane from finding out his true identity, she tells her not to insult him. So uh, we also get Peter Parker and Mary Jane on a date in Coney Island, and they share their first kiss. Just like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man, it is in the rain, except this one, this kiss is not nearly as iconic as the Upside Down kiss which is one of the more memorable moments in the history of superhero cinema, I would say. So uh, we do not necessarily get a recapturing of that here, uh, but it is definitely a significant moment because we are very clearly moving away from the idea of Peter Parker being in a love triangle and his feelings are very clearly with Mary Jane. Yeah, that uh, I, I like that focus as well uh, because that's, you know, that's that's the the main you know the main love the interest throughout you know there's no Gwen Stacy in the series or maybe there was and we just kind of over you know overlooked it but yeah that's going to be the main focus and uh, it's going to get real interesting like I said with the the Hydra Man stuff later on but it's uh, I, I like where they're building up because again like uh, we didn't get uh, a lot of Michael Morbius in this episode hardly any Felicia Hardy but they're in the background like they're in the background believe me building their relationship towards what's going to happen uh, down the line of the season so. I'm pretty excited for the next episode because uh, it's the X-Men. And uh, with all the different rumors coming around about uh, Multiverse of Madness, this seems like the right time to watch this episode, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's because we we may finally be able to get the X-Men and Spider-Man perhaps in the same movie or or TV show. And you you really haven't had that since this, since this particular two episodes. Not to mention, I, I think Spider-Man appeared for a hot second in the X-Men animated series. Like, not even in a speaking role, but I think he was in there for a hot second. Uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, the Sega Genesis SNES game uh, where they fought, fought Arcade. Oh, yeah. I got a, a, one of those emulators, and that was one of the first games I tried out. And, uh, you know, I couldn't get past the first level, but, you know, eventually I will. <laughs> All right, so next week we will be talking about three more episodes. The X-Men are prominently included, as is Morbius achieving his final form. So we have that to very much look look forward to. So for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much. We will be talking to you again next week. Dude, what was Mary Jane doing throwing the ball behind her back and landing it in the fucking thing to get the prize? Like, what kind of crazy, cardy bullshit is that? That's never going to happen. Just ask Jay Sherman.